Good news is bad for for assets because it means the Fed is going to remain you know, hawkish. That it gives them permission to keep going with the tightening cycle. And it's still going to get worse before it gets better. I truly believe that. And so there's going to be a lot of damage, a lot of job loss, a lot of hardship, a lot of death, a lot of like literally like geopolitical disorder. Everything is trending lower. Everything is clearly headed into a recession. He knows that, by the way. Powell is very, very aware that he's going to put us into a recession. That's the problem. And I think if we want to look ahead to the future and what we could expect, look to what's going on in Europe and in the UK, right? I mean, they're, they're just getting decimated right now. What's the strategy for your average mom and pop? A nice, simple, safe strategy. And then maybe what's a more advanced strategy? Could Can you share with us those ideas? Bitcoin could possibly be a peaceful revolution to this that we can kind of opt out of this crazy geopolitical system we're in. G'day, Internet. Max Wright here, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jeff Ross again. Super happy to have you back on the show. Welcome, buddy. Thanks, Max. I'm happy to be here. Now, uh, I really love our chats. We talk about some really fun stuff every time, so let's get straight into it. Here's this kind of the theme that just jumps out at me, and I saw it on your Twitter thread. I, I know you've noticed it too, but it's the, this upside-down bizarro world that good equals bad. It's like, well, if we get good news, like a good jobs report or higher earnings, good news is bad for for assets because it means the Fed is going to remain you know, hawkish. That It gives them permission to keep going with the tightening cycle. Can you just flesh this out? Like, what does that mean when, when the world, is this bizarre world where good means bad? Sure. So I think that Powell and the Federal Reserve have the, the economy and the markets in the palm of their hand right now. And so that's why good news is bad news. So when Powell says that, look, we're going to remain sticky hawkish as long as inflation remains sticky high. And inflation is going to remain sticky high as long as the economy remains strong. And what does he mean by strong? As long as unemployment rates, and they are, he's right, they're at historical lows right now. And so you can't argue with that currently. Now, those are lagging indicators. And we've talked about this before. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. CPI is a lagging indicator. uh, And those are the two things he's following most closely. So what that says to me is that, you know what, as long as these numbers keep going in in his favor, meaning that they still look strong, he can continue his policy of, you know what, we are going to continue to raise rates. We're going to continue the pain. Uh, we're going to continue to do all of this until basically everything crashes. I, and, and, and it was very interesting at the meeting yesterday, and I know we can get into this a little bit, but it was very interesting watching him. I saw him smirk a couple times, um, basically talking about how he controls the message. Um, he knows that if the markets crash, he knows, quote unquote, that if the markets crash, they have very powerful tools and they've proved it in the past to bring the to bring a, a, a nice rebound in risk assets. So to me, he just clearly, clearly wants to see the markets crash. He wants to see a deflationary bust. And I think he's going to get it at some point. But what's so interesting about all this is because of the resilient economy, because unemployment remains historically low uh, based on the metrics they look at, because inflation remains sticky high, this is going to go on for longer than most people think. And I think that a lot of uh, bulls who were um, basing their hopium, basing their bull thesis on a Fed pause, just absolutely had their hopes dashed yesterday. And um, I don't see any reason for, op- you know, <laughs> I hate being this guy. I've been bearish for so long on your show. Every time I come on, I keep talking about how bad it is. And it's still going to get worse before it gets better. I truly believe that. And so there was a shred of hope yesterday that maybe he will hint at a pause. And he just absolutely threw that down to the curb and stepped on it and said, no way, like we are going to continue to be sticky hawkish for longer. That's terrible for risk assets. It's going to be a rough go of it for a while. So, okay. So if good news means bad, what at some point there will be bad news. What does bad news mean? The bad news is when we get the deflationary bust and when we're officially headed very uh, quickly into a serious recession. And so what's going to happen is at some point, you know, unemployment has been down at these historically low levels. At some point, it's just going to go whoop and, and increase quickly. That'll mean basically the economy is absolutely crashing. Nobody can deny it. Even even Powell will be like, yeah, it's it's pretty rough out there. Um, so it, it, unemployment will rise quickly. At that point, that's when... Uh, you know, they're on operation demand destruction right now. Demand will have been destroyed at that point. And so we're going to see things like oil finally will crash. That will sink lower. PMI, you know, businesses, manufacturing, all that stuff. It's already in contractionary um, uh, territory right now, sub 50. Um, That will crash much lower, probably low 40s, even high 30s, those kind of numbers. Basically, the world will shut down. Unemployment will rise. The markets will absolutely lose their minds. So stocks, like I said, I've been calling for NASDAQ 
back 8,000 for a while. I think it goes sub 8,000 still. S&P 500, all of that stuff will just tank. Uh, and that's the deflationary bust he's waiting for. And that's when he's going to come in and he's going to be Superman, swoop in and be like, okay, now it's time for QE infinity. Um, but there's going to be a lot of damage, a lot of job loss, a lot of hardship, a lot of death, a lot of like literally like geopolitical disorder uh, before this is all said and done, unfortunately. When you when you say all that, and I, I agree with everything you're saying here. So it's so so good news means bad because uh, because they get to hold the keep the going with the interest rates, and bad news means bad because it means capitul- capitulation. Mm-hmm. So it seems like we 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 the good side is we know what's going to happen if 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 the thesis is correct, right? Right. Um, what what I kind of see, I look back at that. I look back at the March twenty chart, and I see this 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 like slowly going down, and the 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 volume gets smaller, and the 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 um, VIX of all the different charts gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And at some point, there's a trigger event. In that case, it was COVID. But at some point, there's a trigger event, and there's this massive drop down. But it's very very short lived because they come in with all the all the weaponry that the Fed has, and uh, and kind of buoys markets and stuff like that. So I'm seeing there's gonna my my thesis is that. There is going to be this epic buy opportunity that probably won't last very long in financial assets. Do you agree with that? Or do you think we're just going to drop down and then stay down for a while? That's a great question. I actually think the difference this time around is that we don't have that underlying Fed put like we did before. You know, back in, when COVID happened, the world was already headed towards a recession and that just quickly drew everything in. But we're in a very situa- a very different situation with inflation still high. Paul has made it exceedingly clear, and I believe him, that he is not going to take his foot off of the hawkish pedal, the high interest rate pedal, until he sees convincing, lasting inflation. He says repeatedly, I don't want to make the mistake of what we did in the 70s, where we, you know, we saw inflation come down and then we turned the spigots back on and then inflation just revved right back up again. Uh, he says, we don't want to do that this time. We're going to keep it higher for longer. And so what that tells me, and then, so take that, so keep hold that in your head. Phase two is what I look at with my economic data. We are in an, uh, an economic slowdown, right? Growth is slowing. Everything is slowing around the world. We're headed into a worldwide recession. I see economic slowing continuing all the way into the summer of 2023. And so when you factor in all of that stuff, that tells me that we may be in this process for a lot longer. It's going to be very different in that way from March of 2020 from the COVID uh, ordeal, because that was a flash in the pan, right? It was tremendous pain, super fast with a tremendous rebound. It was that V-shaped recovery. I don't think we get that this time. I think this is going to be more akin to 2000 to 2002 after the dot-com crash, where even though it wasn't uh, too terrible of a recession for the U.S. economy. Markets just came lower and lower and lower and lower. And, and we just had lower high after lower high after lower high. And it just like crushed the souls of everybody, especially for all the people who were big uh, tech investors back then. It just crushed them. Um, and so that's what I think is going to is more likely that we may still be talking. You may have me on your show six months from now. You know, uh, what would that be? May, May 3rd, maybe you'll have me on your show and we'll still be talking about this, that it's still going lower. And can you believe it? Oh, wow. NASDAQ is down to 7,000 we'll be talking about like, is it ever going to bottom? Um, and, and at that point we'll be close to the bottom. And at that point, I think we finally get like a final capitulation, mm-hmm. but, but again, months and months from now, not no time soon will this happen. And that's it. And with, with March 2020, they had an ex, uh, an excuse to, to print like the, the what pandemic, who, who the hell thought, who had that on their radar? Right. And they thought it was a health crisis. We'll, we'll get, we'll get over it. And then we'll just continue on our merry way. They don't have that excuse now. It's more of a fundamental inflation mm-hmm. driven issue that they don't yep. have the excuse that we can just print our way out of it. So a longer term situation. Now that's interesting because we had Q1, Q2, negative growth, technical definition of a recession to consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Technical definition of a depression, six quarters. The time frame you're giving us is taking us through to, to summer of uh so that's so that gives us out six quarters. So you're basically predicting a, a depression here. The trick is the third quarter GDP was technically positive uh, uh-huh. for sort you know, for one off reason. So that sort of throws everything off. So technicalities, right? But but it's go. I think it will. It's going to feel like a depression by that point. I think yeah. by that point, unemployment is going to spike very high. Um, people are going to start wondering if the Fed really can turn this this thing around with their with their massive uh, quantitative easing and such. But yeah, I mean, it, it, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be really ugly. It's going to feel very hopeless. There's going to be tons of turmoil, political issues. I mean, lots of stuff going on. Uh, Six to nine months from now. Let's just stay in the in the pit of misery just for a little bit longer here. <laughs> so we've got 
the 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 rate hikes are the fastest ever. I I can't. I thought something would have broken by now. Actually, I can't believe that um it, it got this high. Mortgage rates. The average thirty year mortgage rate um, hit over seven percent yesterday. You've got. You mentioned the fact that the things he's looking at are lagging indicators. Are we seeing? any leading indicators telling us that, you know, like that you, you've gone too far already. Oh, sure. I mean, you can look at what's, I mean, we're clearly headed into a recession, right? The the yield curve tells us the, the three month and the 10 year, that's the last kind of bastion uh, that people wait for to say um, that that uh, recession is imminent. That has officially inverted and in, in significantly so. And so um, that says that not only is, to me, it says not only is a recession inevitable, it's increasingly imminent. Um, we're watching everything turn over from everybody looks at the stock market, but stocks and bonds and housing, like to your point, real estate. Real estate is just basically frozen now. Nobody's, people aren't even selling anymore because there's nobody to sell to. And they're like, well, if I sell, I have to buy a new house with a new mortgage uh, with, with a 30 year fixed rate greater than 7%. I can't afford that. I'm going to, if I sell, I'm going to have to move into a worse house. So basically it's just freezing up the real estate market. Everything you look at, and when you look at, like we talked about a little bit earlier, the PMI, so manufacturing indices, you know, what is what are the service sectors doing? They're still kind of hanging on right around the 48 to 51 level, which is like right along the edge of contraction. So it's not growing and it's definitely trending lower. Everything you look at, if you look at all of this data and you, and you kind of look ahead based on where the trends are, everything is trending lower. Everything is clearly headed into a recession. He knows that, by the way, Powell is very, very, very aware that he's going to put us into a recession. That's his plan. Like I said, he wants to do that. He's hoping for this big, quick deflationary bust so he can swoop in and start QE again. Um, but again, I think this may last uh, longer, uh, even than he wants. I think that's why he's so darn hawkish when he talks. I mean, he's literally, he was just pummeling the market yesterday uh, with his comments. Like it's not even time to think about a, a Fed pause yet. And, and terminal rates are going to be much higher than we talked about originally. All this kind of stuff, we're going to have to hold rates higher for much longer. He's trying to pummel the market down. He's like single-handedly just Mike Tysoning, you know, the markets because mm -hmm. he wants it to go down sooner. But again, like based on the stuff I look at is we're probably going to be dealing with this garbage for like another nine months, which is sort of unfortunate. Yeah. So he, uh, and I, I think you're right because I think that he thinks, I think that's what I think is that the longer it goes and the harder he has to be, the worse it's going to be on the other side. Mm -hmm. So I think in his perspective is just like, for the love of God, markets, can you just capitulate <laughs> yes. now for me? Just, just it would die. Just be, it would just die, please. I'm like, I'm strangling you. Just stop trying to breathe. <laughs> and uh, and that way it won't be so bad on the other side. So he's, mm -hmm. he's uh, yeah. So um, do you, so why, why are the markets not capitulating? Let's, why is that not happening? Well, they're down quite a bit, right? I mean, the NASDAQ, what's the NASDAQ down now? 35% or so from its peak. And, and the S&P is in the 20%, still 20, 25%. This, it kind of goes to his other point of, you know, the economy has been pretty strong. It's been fairly resilient and it's, it's hard to kill the U.S. economy, that we are we're a very very strong economy, and so. Um uh, there's a chance that things, and, and the other point is we never really recovered from the uh, COVID mandates that basically shut businesses down, crushed humans, crushed small businesses. Um, we never got back to full employment from those levels. So so like the services sector is still trying really hard to uh, to gain employees. They're, they're still understaffed and still working really hard to find uh, employees. The economy is resilient. And so that's the problem. And I think if we want to look ahead to the future and what we could expect, look, to what's going on in Europe and in the UK, right? I mean, they're, they're just getting decimated right now. A big, big problem is because of the high energy costs. They're further along than we are in this recessionary path. Like they, they have, a, they're experiencing a ton of pain. The citizens are experiencing a ton of pain right now, and it's going to get worse there. So um, they're, they're ahead of us. And we're here in the US like, well, it's, it's kind of bad, but it's still not like terrible. You can't really argue that it's really terrible here yet with unemployment levels as low as they are. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, like I said, and to your point, like he's just trying to kill the economy and he, and he really can't. Uh, and, and so that's why I think we, we're going to continue to see, you know, higher rates and, uh, and and being held high for longer. So it's just going to be painful. Risk assets don't like that. And, and, and let me just sum it up because I know it can be confusing for people. When the economy is slowing and the Fed is tightening at the same time, the economy is slowing. For whatever reason, historically, that's a terrible setup for risk assets. And so when we're talking about stocks and, and, and Bitcoin, again, and I don't believe it's 
it's a risk asset, but it gets pulled down and treated like a risk asset because people still don't understand it. The whole crypto space, all that kind of stuff is a risk asset. Um, that does terribly uh, in that kind of situation. So that's why I remain so bearish and why I think that this could last for longer because I see a slowing economy lasting for still another maybe nine months from now with the Fed continuing to tighten. That's just a one-two punch for risk assets. Gotcha. All right, let's pull ourselves out of the misery for a second. Let's put our monocle in, twirl our mustache and figure <laughs> out how do we go Monopoly Man on this and just make more wealth than we've ever made in this time. What's the strategy here that you think, and let's, get, let's do, do this in a couple different ways. What's the strategy for your average mom and pop? A nice, simple, safe strategy. And then maybe what's a more advanced strategy? Could, can you share with us those ideas? Sure, sure. And I think we talked about this a month ago and it hasn't changed. So it's just, it's, it's actually gotten more um, important to do this. Um, for for the, the, the simple retail investor, you have a 401k, 403b, IRA, you don't really know what to do. You see, you're kind of concerned, just raise cash. So so maybe you've had a 60-40 stock bond portfolio. You've gotten crushed this year and I feel terrible for you. Um, the, the, it's still, like I said, I think we still are going to go lower. So it's not too late to hedge. I say this all the time to people. The easiest way to hedge is just to hold more cash. So if you're, if you're used to being 100% invested, maybe move that down to 80% and holding 20% in cash, or maybe moving that down to 50% and holding 50% in cash. There's nothing wrong with doing that. You can wait till the dust settles. Like I, like I think this has much longer to go. So you're not going to miss anything by just being patient and waiting and sitting on the sidelines in cash. That's the easiest way to do it. More advanced techniques and what we do kind of at Valeshire for my, in my hedge fund and for my clients, you can go long the dollar. There are, there are vehicles where you can, so the dollar is showing incredible strength. So one way is just to hold the dollar, but you can also buy a, an entity. There's one called UUP, which is basically as the dollar or as the Dixie strengthens, UUP strengthens uh, accordingly. And so that is up, I think it's up like 10 to 15% or so this year. That's one way to actively profit uh, from what's going on. Um, two, it's super obvious and it goes against what most people believe it. All you got to do is short risk assets. So if you're able to short stocks, especially high growth tech innovation type stocks, which just kill it in the good years, you know, they kill it in the Kathy Wood era, the 2010 to 2021 time. They're just, just like they just crushed it. They're going to get crushed in a recessionary bear market, which we're headed into. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with shorting that. I like to short the NASDAQ. There are, there are many ways to do that. You can just buy vehicles. You don't have to even actively short them. There are ETFs that short for you on your behalf. Um, so you can, you can look into those kind of things. Uh, again, not individual investment advice, just general, general ideas. You know, there, there are other, there, and, and for people, who, there are still people who are long only. A couple things that are still doing well, despite all of this carnage that's been going on, value stocks are outperforming growth stocks. So, so look to value. I think that's going to be a theme for this, um, this decade, basically. Energy stocks, oil and gas stocks are actually still holding up well. They still have been bullish throughout this whole time. A couple tickers that I like that I've been holding in our Valeshare accounts for a while, Occidental Petroleum. Why do I choose that one? Because Warren Buffett loves Occidental Petroleum and Berkshire Hathaway has been buying tons and tons of shares. So we talk about a Fed put under the markets, which doesn't exist anymore. We have a Berkshire put underneath Occidental Petroleum. Anytime the price dips substantially, Berkshire Hathaway has been scooping up massive amounts of shares. I think they're probably just going to buy the company eventually and be you know, uh, majority owners of it. And then another oil and gas stock that's also a real estate play. Uh, the ticker is TPL, Texas Pacific Land Trust. Um, it's basically they own tons and tons of acreage in Texas, which has oil in it, and they lease out the land and they make money. And all they do is just take that money, say thank you. They buy back their shares. They pay a small dividend. Um, and that's a, that's a solid company. And I've been happy to own that. And then one other, actually, I don't know if this will last, um, but um, uh, biotech stocks, at, according to my uh, Valeshire's long-term trading system, they actually just entered into a new bull market. I don't know if it's going to last though. It's teetering right at the edge. It may just drop down and go bearish again, but that is one thing, a new position we just added from the long side in our portfolios. Okay. Very good. I want to zoom in on two of those strategies there. Um, let's talk about shorting there for a second. So shorting tech stock. This is by definition, a, a leveraged position. Yes. And uh, as such, leveraged positions can get margin called and called out. And it's I, on the upside, you buy a stock and you can sit and wait. As long as you're not using leverage, you can wait forever and you don't really care about short-term volatility. On the shorting side, you must care about the short-term volatility because it is by definition a leverage position and you can get uh, margin called. And so, you know, the market's going to remain irrational longer than you can remain liquid is, is the saying. First of all, is that assessment 
true and fair and uh, in the hands of remember this question is for a um like a retail mom and pop investor sure so if some of these um products do not actually require margin to use they just require for you though and and so any standard brokerage firm that you use they will say these are very aggressive products they will say like what are what are your um your goals for investing and if you lean any type of conservative even moderate ish on your investing goals they won't let you even invest in these products. But if you say I am aggressive or most aggressive, then they'll pr probably grant you permission. And if you have enough money, they, they, they base that off two things. They make sure you're, you're wealthy enough to know what you're doing. Uh, so they let you invest in these sort of more advanced products. You don't need margin to, to own some of these products. Um, like you're not technically borrowing to short, you're actually buying these as a long position, but, and then worked within the product is the shorting mechanism that if that makes sense. So you can find those things. Uh, and, and I, I'll, always recommend for anything, whether long or short, just use trailing stop losses, have some, have some, some stop loss so that if things go against you and your thesis is just wrong, um, that you can stop yourself out and you don't lose your shirt um, because you put too much, too, too many eggs into one basket without protecting that basket. Yeah. See, I think stop losses in the hands of, um, amateurs is really dangerous because you can That's be true. right and get kicked out of your position. Also I, true. So I prefer to say to people, just don't put all the eggs in that basket, maybe have some long positions as well, head mm -hmm. yourself in that way. But it's just tragic when, you know, one position gets kicked out of its position and then all of a sudden you are hundred percent in one direction or the other, and then it goes against you and then you get hurt really badly. So I advise a little bit of a different thing there, but I take your point well. So the shorting thing, okay, that's good. I didn't even know that there were ways to do that where it was a little bit safer. Um, but so now let's flip to the inverse ETF basket. This is, uh, I, I, in my word, I, I wanna, I'm checking in, <clears throat> pardon me, that I'm giving good advice here. Um, I, I feel this is a lot safer for retail because you can't get, you won't get kicked out. You can, this is, you can just sit and hold. And, you know, if you, if you are right in your thesis, even if you're wrong on your timing, it will come good. You won't get kicked out of your position. Uh, is that a fair assessment? Have I got my head around the inverse ETFs correctly? Yes. And in fact, that's actually what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about shorting through these ETF products, what I'm talking about is inverse ETFs. So, so gotcha. absolutely to your point. So yeah, we're, we're sort of dancing around each other. My bad, but yeah, so inverse ETFs are, and super easy way to short the market because you don't you don't need margin to do it um, and you can just buy it like a long position which is nice the other reason why I like them and they're sort of um, considered like uh, less advanced maybe <clears throat> than outright shorting because they have a little bit higher fees trading fees than traditional shorting using margin I like to use these though because when I'm right when you're shorting okay, say say I'm shorting the Nasdaq if I'm right on my outright short NASDAQ position, the position actually gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and I'm capped at 100% gain. But when you use these inverse ETFs, you can actually, as you're right, your position actually gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and you get more and more right, and it impacts your portfolio uh, more significantly. If I'm right and I'm shorting, I continually have to decide, am I going to add to this position to keep having the same impact from a percentage-wise basis? Do I want to mm -hmm. keep adding? Do I want to keep adding? Like, well, I hate to keep adding at these lower prices now because I was so right earlier up here. Anyways, it's just an interesting dynamic that for me and the way I do things and using my momentum and trailing stop strategies, I actually prefer the inverse products over shorting outright. Excellent. Okay. Good to know. And also you can have a leveraged in first position without the risk of the margin call. The the, the losses will be bigger. The, the gains will be uh, bigger potentially in both directions. However, you don't have this issue of getting kicked out one way or another. And if you have the staying power, you can stay in these positions. Can you um, can you maybe drop a few uh, ticker symbols here of inverse ETFs that you're uh, you're interested in or, or, or play with? Sure, sure. So so if you just wanted to use the S and P 500, you know I, I like to I look at the two pairs. So there's SPY and then SH. SH is just the short, you know, one X short of of the S and P 500. That's a fantastic one to think about if if you want to use this kind of thing and dabble. I like to focus more on the Nasdaq. So I like the Q series, and there's a whole there's a whole series. So if you're one X leverage, so if you want to just go, you know straight up normal long the the nasdaq qqq if you want to be 1x short the nasdaq you can use a psq and then you can go to 2x leverage so 2x long qld uh, 2x short qid 
It's like an inverse D. And then triple long and triple short. TQQQ is triple long and SQQQ is triple short. The one thing, I mean, you guys got to understand, uh, first of all, I'm not recommending these at all to people. They are very, very, very volatile. I mean, you get whipped around 10, 15, 20% on some days, and that's pretty wild for a lot of people. So be very careful um, if you do use them. Um, and just please have a plan. Don't just like buy them and hold them and forget about them because they'll, they can like terrorize your portfolio if you if you get it in the wrong direction. So just things to keep in mind. Yeah, very useful to know. And just to explain those doubles and triples for people, I mean, if the S&P goes up 2%, your position goes up 4% and vice versa in the negative direction. Is that, yep. that a good assessment of those? That's what they try to do. Then they're not perfect, just so you know, too. They they target that region, like the three, the triple X, like a TQQQ, it tries to go up three. So if the NASDAQ goes up 1%, these go, they should go up 3%. It can be anywhere from 2% to like 5%. It just depends depends on the day, um, depends on the technique, depends on how many buyers and sellers they have of that specific entity. Uh, gotcha, gotcha. So with some ETFs, uh, they are they are not suitable for long-term holds because the fees involved in them is, uh, they're, just, they're just designed a different way. They're designed for short-term holds, day, day, day trading, um, hedging. Are these ETFs, are they the type of ones that are suitable to hold for six, 12 months? Uh, the, the fees aren't going to eat you alive? The fee's not terrible. Like I'm just looking up right now. So SQQQ, that's the triple short NASDAQ. Expense ratio is 0.95%. So that's the only for kind the, of fee. For the year? Yes, for the year. That's an annual fee, basically. So okay. if you're using an advisor, if you're getting charged 1%, now your your charge technically is up to 1.95%. So you really hope that you're right when you hold these things. You want to, it really pays off if you're correct, right? So like if you would have been holding the SQQ all year. Like, let me just for just because we're here, if you would have been holding the SQQQ year to date from January 1st, at least according to um, uh, Seeking Alpha, you would be up 112% right now uh, yeah. while everything is crashing. So it pays to do it. So the 0.95% fee doesn't seem too bad if you're up 112% in a bear market. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, let's go now to so if we wanted to take a short position here, a, a generally speaking, a broad term, including inverse ETFs and whatever else, what are some of the, do you think are the safest short positions where we can be most confident? Um, and maybe this plays into a little bit more macro. We talked about rising dollar, strengthening dollar. That usually means disaster for developing world, Europe. Is it is the safest place to short here in the States or is it even is it even an even safer bet, uh, you might say, to be shorting Europe, to be shorting somewhere else? Uh, and, and do you have any of those positions? Safe is a tough question, right? So what does mm -hmm. safe mean exactly? Like, what is it? Is it less volatile? I think that, like, I think that the U.S is headed for a difficult time, but I think it's worse in Europe. Um, you might get more bang for your buck still shorting European stocks. They're probably going to be quite a bit more volatile though. And I also think because they're a little further along and a little it, uh, a bit of a, in a more uh, more terrible situation, I think their central banks are going to intervene more quickly. And so they have a chance to rebound more quickly. So the trick is if you're shorting, it could blow up in your face. Um, if suddenly, you know, they turn the spigots on and they go into QE infinity uh, while we're still tightening over here in the United States. So that's tough. I think if you want to be safe, what you need to do is keep your position sizes small. Don't shoot for the moon, uh, especially now. Like the time to short is when everybody else thinks that the, the bear market is over, right? And and we've had a nice rally. You want to short at that point. Now we've had such a, a big pullback in NASDAQ stocks, in a lot of European stocks. A lot of the gains have already been made in those shorts. So you have to be just a little bit careful. I'm a big believer in timing as well. Most people say you can't time the market. I have a system that does. We take profits when we've been really right and we're, you know, and the short has been driven into the ground and gets oversold, we'll take profits and then we'll let it drift back up. When it gets back to this sort of um, overbought levels, uh, we'll go in heavy again at that point and then hopefully ride down the next wave lower. So there are different techniques to do it. I just tell people to be cautious. If you want lower volatility, don't do these double and triple leveraged uh, equity products. Please don't do that. You'll 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 just freak out watching your, your daily uh, uh, balances move up and down. Think more like that UUP I talked about just being long the dollar. Even if you're really right, a good day to be really right in the dollar, it may go up one or two percent. You know, it's not. It's it's very non-volatile. You could think about the bond market as well. You know, you can short and go long um, treasuries as well. That's another way to play it. So I don't know. Different techniques. Just be very careful out there if you're going to use any kind of these products. Gotcha. And let's use the the last couple of minutes here to answer a couple of bi bi bigger concept questions here. Not even 
necessarily money related, but just what's the world going to look like, do you think, on the other side of this? If you cash your mind forward three, four, five years, uh, we do, uh, you know, should we should we be excited by this cleansing process? Should we be terrified that it ushers in strong men, like, you know, and we get, you know, we have another Hitler scenario? Like what, uh, what do you think is going to happen here over the next five years? I am admitted, admittedly a little concerned about where we're headed. Like we're, we have the conditions set up again for sort of like we did back in the 1930s and 40s, terrible economic um, situation, huge income disparity, lots of inequality that makes people very unhappy as it probably should. Populism is on the rise, right? We got the Bernie Sanders on the left and the Trump's on the right. And and there's like, it's, it's almost silly to be politically moderate right now. Like you have to basically pick a side. Geopolitical tensions, when the when the economy is headed into recession, um, people get very testy, people lose work, people get desperate. I look at this and I think, man, this is the setup for bad things to happen, like on a worldwide level. So I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Um, I, I like to think that, um, you know, it, it, not, to, not to always bring it back to Bitcoin, but that Bitcoin could possibly be a peaceful revolution to this, that we can kind of opt out of this crazy geopolitical system we're in with its, with, um, you know, these, these centralized world powers that have just a total monopoly on violence. And we can sort of defund that peacefully through Bitcoin and sort of spread the power out to the people instead of to these centralized governments. Um, but that takes a long time and Bitcoin is still way too small uh, to, to have any meaningful impact. I mean, if it's a $400 billion asset. It needs to be like a 10 to 20 to $50 trillion asset before it will really move the needle um, in world politics. So yeah, I'm a little nervous, to be honest. I, I do think on the other side of this, we're going to have some kind of systemic reset and the world will look very different 10 years from now. Like, I think we don't look that different from, you know, 2012, but I think 2032, 10 years ahead, will look extremely different than the world we're in right now, for better and for worse. So Jeff, did you happen to catch the uh, Michael Saylor Atlas Society interview where he talked about Bitcoin as the the union to escape this the system? I did. I watched that. I, I watched that. And I mean, the, the ideas I've, I've thought for a long time, I'm going to guess that you have too. But I thought that was one of the uh, the the best articulations of that that I'd heard in quite a while. Uh, just your thoughts on that? He does a great job with all of that stuff. He's obviously a just super intelligent guy. So it's fun to have him on, on our team. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what's coming with not only geopolitically in the world, but I think that the central banks are, are, are starting to already employ the financial repression techniques. Um, basically, what happened in the U.S. post-World War II, right? We had this unpayable amount of debt. What do you do when you have a, a country that's laden with unpayable debt? One, t You can default on it, but nobody's going to default on it, right? So what you can do is you can let inflation run hot. You can force um, yields lower. So force basically treasury bond yields lower, let inflation run hot. So your real yields are actually negative. What does that do? You can actually inflate your debt away. The only problem when countries do that is um, th they're, they're paying back their debt on the backs of their citizens, on the purchasing power of their citizens. And so um, things are really different now today. I think central banks are already doing that. We're already seeing that in Japan, by the way, who has over 250% debt to GDP. There, what are they doing? They're doing yield curve control. They're debasing their currency. They're holding interest rates steady and they're letting inflation run hot. So they're literally doing what's called financial repression on their citizens. Their citizens are paying for it by the value of the yen rapidly decreasing. So their purchasing power is, is uh, declining rapidly. That worked here in the US in the 1940s, post-World War II. Why? People couldn't invest in gold. It was actually legal to own gold back then, and Bitcoin didn't exist. This time around, we have the same situation, uh, and but this time you can own gold and you can opt out entirely of the current financial monetary system with Bitcoin. And so that's very interesting, and I think that's part of what Michael Saylor likes to talk about too. Is it's an it's an escape from the current system. It's literally a parallel monetary and financial system. And so the whole financial repression techniques in order to save the government on the backs of their citizens probably won't work quite as well this time around because we have um, alternatives. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next few years. Yeah, we'll be interested to see that play out. And I, I think that's a really good point. It's like, so be, because debts are just absolutely out of control all the way across the board, uh, and I mean that country by country across the world, the, 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 it's, an, it's an open secret. You know, their goal is they, they will inflate that debt away. They literally have no other choice. Now, of all the different ways to raise money from your citizens, inflation is the most insidious because it hurts the 
the poorest the most, helps the richest the most, and you get that hollowing out of the middle class and you get this Hunger Games scenario of rich and poor. And that the, 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 reach, the reaches a breaking point. I, you know, I love the, the old America, you could celebrate the rich guy because you, you were getting richer too, maybe just not as fast, and maybe they worked harder and you could, you could live with it. But under those conditions where you're getting poorer, they're getting richer, there's a lot of resentment. And that's where you get the political strife. That's where you get the violence. That's where you get the revolutions. That's where you get the thing. And that's going to be happening all over the world because every country is in the same boat, too much debt, having to get out of that debt. And they're going to, they're going to inflate it away. And the consequences are a very unhappy citizenry. I These do. are the problems. Yeah. Um, all right, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, joining us here. Guys, I highly recommend if you have not watched the um, the video with uh, Michael Saylor, go ahead, click this link right now. It is an absolute must watch, a beautiful articulation of uh, the Bitcoin situation and why everybody should have it in their portfolio to escape this mayhem that is coming to us thick and fast. Take care.